feel like there's everybody who's trying to sell a master class, whether you're trying to make it big on Instagram, sell an $89, $99, learn how to be a man master class, and they're a dime a dozen right now. I was always a new kid. Uh, Growing up military, my dad, submariner, like literally we would move two to four years all the time. I learned how to be a man through the people that I saw. Dude, I grew up without a father figure, so um, being a man has been a daily journey. The examples a lot of times that I would see modeled were in music and entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and culture didn't always align with like, truly like what it means to be a man. I wanted to emulate what I saw my friends doing, so I kind of neglected the good life mm -hmm. so I could chase the struggle when it really just wasn't my testimony. You know what's really good is like this right here. For sure. This is what, honestly, I feel like more men need so that we can converse with each other, so that we can connect with each other, really just build each other up just right. by this moment. But, Hey, fellas, I want you to hear this. You are in store for an amazing night tonight. So, hey, do me a favor, stand up on your feet, and let's go crazy and welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Stephen Chandler. Come on, y'all. How you feeling, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm pumped. First of all, I'm so proud of every man in this room to be in the house of God, pursuing God so that he can build you into the world changer that he's called you to be. Come on, can you put your hands together for you? Hear me, if nobody told you lately that you're doing a great job, you're doing a great job yeah. working, providing for your family, taking care of your neighbor, I'm, I honor you. And I'm grateful for you here at Union Church. Yeah. Good deal, we doing Q&A? We're doing Q&A. &A. And uh, now, what are the rules, because the thing is, I'm not prepped for any of these questions. Oh, gosh. So whatever I say, <laughs> you cleaned it up, sir. <laughs> Are we online? So we get canceled. Yeah. Oh, that makes it all the more fun. Yeah, this is this. great. This is great. This all is great. the way. Well, go ahead. Grab your phone if you have it. Text 9700. You men to 97,000. No, it's 9700. 97000. Is that 1,000? Fly zeros. I don't know what APR means either, though, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> to 97,000, throw those questions in there. And we're ready to go. We're ready to go. Let's rumble. All right, Pastor Steven, help us with this uh -oh. statement, uh, with this, do you think Bronny is ready to oh. go into the league? Let us know your thoughts. Oh, We man. need some help out here. Is that where we're starting? <laughs> starting right there. Golly. Oh, so man. here's what I think the whole brawny, and I don't know what this got to do with church, but here's what I think the whole brawny to the NBA thing is. I think it's a publicity stunt. Okay. If you read what he said, well, we he said, I'm eligible for the draft, but I'm keeping my eligibility for college and I'm entering the transfer portal. I don't think he's ever actually going to go into the NBA draft. I think he's kind of just testing the water. I think he's going to do a sophomore year. I hope he does a sophomore year. I pray he does a sophomore year. And junior and senior year, and then he could play. And I think everybody should mind their business. Yeah, well. Leave this kid alone. Okay, 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 okay. Here's okay. the deal. Here's okay, the deal. okay. Here's is this deal. men's night? This is men's night. Treat him like a man. Yes. Here's why. Okay. Because when Durant was 18, Carmelo was 18, all the superstars this were 18, team. they were ripping them apart, looking at their stats and all that. But because we know Bronny's dad, we treat them with kid gloves, bro. This ain't got nothing to do with how good he is. Uh -huh. Matter of fact, I've never heard him talk before. I've never even heard his voice. <laughs> it doesn't matter. His dad wants to play at least one game with him in an NBA. They're both leaving. Bronny can care less have, have about you being seen in the this NBA. Season LeBron is having? Ah. He's going to be here another five years, bro. That man yeah, is he just want one <laughs> Teflon. He just wants one year with his son. And I, I actually respect it. I respect a guy who's putting himself out there and saying, I want to play with my son. He's making the league say, hire him, draft him. People up in the front office, they do this every year. They do this all the time. We, we see coaches' sons, and this, we know okay. this son can't coach. Can we change this to a man's night conversation? Yeah, it. Is it right for a father to ruin his son's future to fulfill his own dream? Why we go there? That was too, that's too fast. What you got there? Whose legacy are we worried about? We're defined, but you're defining ruining his son's you, life. Do you think he's ready? 
No. Well, going to the NBA before you're ready is ruining your career. But he's not. He he's trying hey, to play hey, with his hey, dad, hey, man. Hey, 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 the hey. reality of it is, is this. The reality of it is. <laughs> The reality of it is, he wouldn't. That was we wouldn't even know. Sorry. We wouldn't even know who he is without without his dad. I think I personally can. can I, I, if you want to go deep, let's make it even deeper. Uh uh-uh. Personally, uh-huh. I think our society, our culture, will benefit from seeing a dad fighting to get his son in a position. His son ain't gonna play thirty minutes a game. Two minutes out of every game, he's gonna come out there. <laughs> LeBron's gonna throw him the ball. And we need to see it. We see so much fathers Let's and see, sons what's who are destroyed. What did they say? What did they say? They said 27 percent. You're not ready. You should give it another year. 22 percent says there's value in development. You should consider. I don't understand. It's the same thing. I'm saying 100 percent. Everybody mind your business. If you Let his father. You'll be better than your dad. You know what I do know? 23 plus 35 plus 5 don't eat a, equal 100. So I don't know what that. <laughs> I don't know what that's saying. <laughs> All right, let's get into some real questions. Leave Bronny alone. Well, let's let's get so into the conversation. Hustle, grind, and man, self-made. And um, the way that I was raised in a single-parent household, you see somebody actually hustling to make ends meet, mm-hmm. where you're working yeah. long hours, multiple jobs. And yeah. so I was raised with the mentality that, like, yo, when your head hits the pillow, you better have earned that sleep wow. and be dog-tired and exhausted. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Like my my mom, single parent home, so worked multiple jobs, raising two males, and so it was all you saw was the grind. And so I saw that model, so that translated into like my schoolwork, that translated into like my athleticism. But even as an adult now, I find myself working hard and, and grinding. And that, that plays into different areas. So now I'm trying to find myself not being a perfectionist and, and learning how to rest and working to rest um, because I saw that model. So it becomes a part of your DNA because it's modeled for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, hustle culture, man. Grinding for us was survival mode. Mm. Um, enough was never enough. Mm. Uh, and then if you could get it, you got it. Um, and it just forced you into the mentality of uh, just really doing whatever it took to get whatever you need to get, but it was truly like never enough. So survival mode became a habit and we've just been grinding out like that ever since. So P.S., the question was, how do you stay motivated to work hard and be content? And how much money is enough? Say that again, that was three different questions in one. So the first question is, how do you stay motivated to work hard and be content? Okay. And how much money is enough money? How do you stay motivated to work hard, right? Yes, sir, and be content. And be content with that, okay? And then the next question is? How much money is enough money? How much money? That's a great question. No, there's never enough money. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) I think, how do you stay motivated? Motivation is based on having a vision for where you're going. A lot of people don't have a vision for where they're going. And when you don't have a vision for where you're going, Tuesdays is the same thing as Thursday, same thing as Saturday. It's easy to give up. So you've got to have, the Bible says where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Anybody sleeping to 10, 11 o'clock in the morning that did not work the night shift the night before is a person that does not have a vision. That's why they don't got no alarm clock. You need a vision for where you're going. How much money is enough? I I, 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 I will say this way. Obviously, you can't give a number because everybody lives different lives and all that. I think as much money as you can make without neglecting the call of God on your life. Yeah. is what your target should be. So what does that mean? It means don't sacrifice your morality and your relationship with God. Don't sacrifice your health. Don't kill yourself. And don't sacrifice your children, your family, your future, friendships for another dollar. Yeah. But once I can be a good father, be a good husband, keep healthy, honor God, secure the bag, and stop making excuses. 100%. 100%. Can I step on some toes? I mean, I, mean, we, we I, think, for the, I think part of the hustle culture um, is, is change. But there's a group of guys that we need to address. <clears throat> and these are the guys that feel like I can't work a job unless it's my dream job. Oh, and uh, <laughs> keep going. I'm with, I'm with you. Because there's, like, there's a lot of guys who are like, we'll, they'll, we'll, we'll say, hey, man, it's, hustle culture is bad. Hustle culture is unhealthy. Hustle culture, I've heard a lot of that. Who said that? And so, 
guys who did hustle culture almost dying because they because they because they lost their morality. They lost their family. So they said, hey, y'all, this team no sleep. We need to get out of that. Yeah. But it, it's seasons. Some guys have decided if it's not my dream, I'm not going to do it. And I've learned that you have to work a job you like until you get to have a career you love. Yeah. And a lot of guys neglect the season of their life where you may have to work a job you don't like. So most guys today would rather be broke to pursue a dream instead of working a job that may be not the best thing for me right now in order to get me to where I need to be. And I really think that uh, you got to sometimes do the thing you don't want to do until you yep. get to do the thing that you love to do. And until what you love to do allows you to make provision for your family, uh, you got to keep grinding, you got to keep working, you got to keep hustling. It's going to sound ratchet. I think you earned the right to have a calling. Mm -hmm. you, you earn the right to have a calling, meaning if I'm not fulfilling my responsibilities as a man, 100%. I don't have the right to say, oh, this is what I want to do, and here's what I'm gifted to do. No, you do what you have to do. 100%. And when you've done what you have to do, then you do what you want to do and what you get to do. 100%. That's the definition of being a man. It, it ain't about what's convenient. And, yeah. But yeah, my, my, I grew up single mom, so I watched my mom go to school. I watched my mom work. I watched my mom do all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't want to pick on my dad, but, you know, uh -oh. you know my dad... <laughs> Uh, I put it like this. If you're, if you're over uh, 40, 45 years old and you're still trying to get a, a rap career, can you stop, please? Just cut it out. And uh, it's not going to happen. Give it up. And, uh, you put 45? If, uh, huh? You put 45? Yeah. 30, what 30, age should 35? you stop rapping? Like, what, what age should you be like, I'm, I'm not a rapper? Like, it's not working out. Now, my dad wasn't a rapper. My dad was a singer. Like, yeah, he was, he a, was singer. a singer. Yeah, but, you know. What he, day do you give it up? Yeah, what age do you be like, you're not going to, like... Yo, Yo, it's pretty darn close to 30. Is it 30? It might be 29. Okay. At 31. Yeah. And here's the deal. If, if you ain't platinum by 31. Here's the deal. If you're trying to be a rapper, if you're here right now and you're trying to be a rapper, the one dude that would sign you just got raided by the police. So it's not going to be a rapper. So just... No, he didn't. <laughs> That's crazy. No, he didn't. That's Maybe crazy. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, we're all on. That's why. <laughs> no diddy. All in your videos. <laughs> <laughs> <That's my shit. laughs> is that oh, what we're going? Is that what we're going to say? <laughs> You're not getting signed. It's a big deal. <laughs> oh we man! Don't, don't make the band. All right. Don't no wait. No way. Okay. No diddy. Okay. No diddy. <laughs> Fellas, I want to remind y'all. <laughs> You said what you said. We all knew who you were talking oh about. My Lord. Yeah, don't get swallowed up. So, men, text the word "you men" to the number uh, nine seven zero 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 so you can participate and see your numbers pop up on the screen. Don't forget, you men to ninety seven thousand. Uh, next question: Where do you start when you're considering your legacy and deciding on what your legacy will be? Ooh. And then, what are some biblical elements of legacy? Oh gosh. This, this legacy man right here. Um, for me, biblical legacy starts with uh, the scripture that says, when Jesus said, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. And I tell every man, you are not supposed to be a whisper mm. in a cave. You are supposed to be a shout wow. on a hill, uh, which means that we should know you're here. Uh, your life should count today. Your life should matter right now. And I think that uh, legacy starts with, the whole idea of legacy is I'm leaving something behind. Yeah. And most people make legacy a death conversation. When I die, that's my legacy. But the truth is, the last job you had, you left a legacy there. The last girlfriend you dated, you left a legacy there. Uh -oh. uh, with your children right now, you are leaving a legacy right now. There's an idea that they have of you. And most guys are preparing for their death, but they never consider what I need to be doing in my life. Yeah. And uh, let your light shine means that uh, it's the idea that I should, almost like if you're walking on a beach, if you're walking in sand, I should see your footprint in the sand even when you're not there. And so when you leave a room, your footprint should still be there. When you leave a job, your footprint should still be there. When you leave a team, your footprint to still be there. And I think a lot of times we're not focusing on am, what type of footprint yeah. am I leaving in the ground 
right now yeah. that's going to impact people's lives. The thought that comes to my mind is nobody wants to carry your legacy if there's nothing great that you built. Sheesh. Like, the only reason we're having a brawny conversation exactly. is because James was so great. Yeah. Nobody's having a Derek Fisher conversation. I'm just... Okay, stop, stop, stop. Anyway! So here's the thought. God. Dominate every day. Come on. Don't give a day away. Hey, I'm going to give you all some homework. There's an interview with Kobe Bryant and Nick Saban yeah. on YouTube. Probably one of the most intense interviews I've ever seen in my life. And Kobe said, he said, I never thought about championships. Mm. You know, he's famous for fighting teammates in practice and yeah. all that. And he said, all I thought was dominate every practice. And he said, if I dominate practice, yeah. I'm going to be good in the game. Yeah. If I'm good in the game, I'm going to get championships. Yeah. He said, I'm not worried about championships. I'm worried about dominating every day. I feel part of your legacy is never give a day away. Yeah. Like, if you're going to work, give it your all. If you're going to rest, give it your all. If you're going to worship, give it your all. But when you have days where you're not giving that day, whatever it entails, your all, you're not going to have much of a legacy. 100%. Is legacy, is, credit, is your credit report part of your legacy? Is second? Is your credit report part of your legacy? <laughs> Should a guy look at his credit report and be like, you the know The Bible what? says <laughs> that God won't punish the children for the sins of the father. So my kids ain't going to get the credit. <laughs> oh, God. What's the next one? What's the next one? So, so since we're still talking about money, can I be the provider if I'm not the main breadwinner in the house? Ooh. Is that where we're going there? Can I say something? Go Please. ahead. I just want to look into the camera. Uh, I've been married 16 years. If my wife is watching this, baby, make all the money you want. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to make your six figures, girl, I'm letting the world know. Make it, girl, girl. You go, girl, girl. Do you? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I'm ready. You yeah. done? Yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I had I had issues with this. Yeah, yeah. I was definitely the type of dude. I'm never gonna let my wife out earn me. Yeah. And I was guilty of this. Because when I first got married, my wife made more money than me. And it crushed my ego. So, I'm not going to continue to crush it, but I'll leave it. <laughs> so, so you had one goal in your life and you failed from day one? God, day one, day one, day one. that's rough. <laughs> okay, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. Come on, come on. No, no, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> she made more money than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what I would do. I would say, I would say hey, uh, you, ha you keep your money. I'll pay the bills from my money, and you can have fun with your money. Yeah, yeah. Because I wanted to be able, if we ever got into an argument, I wanted to be able to say, I pay the bills. I pay the bills right here. I don't care how much money you make. I pay the rent. Hey, y'all, don't clap for that. I know it's men's night, but we still got to go home to the women. So don't. <laughs> I had to have that. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? So what happens every month, I pay the bills, and I, be, I, be, I have no money. <laughs> I'm done. So I would go to my wife and be like, hey, can I, babe, can I borrow some? I borrow $25. Oh, my, my God. Would be, she would look at me like, it's our money. Why are you asking? It's our No, 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 no. That's your money. <laughs> this is mine. But I can I borrow $5? And I'm borrowing money from my wife because I was, I was an idiot, right? So at that moment, I'm yeah. thinking individually. But what I realized is that what my wife was looking at she saw my grind. She saw my hustle. Yeah, yeah. She saw my vision. She saw my work ethic. She saw that I'm first wake up, last go to sleep. She saw that I'm like on it. And she saw my earning potential. Mm -hmm. She knew that I was sowing the right seeds in this season for my earning potential to rise. Yeah. And what happened was because I managed the, that season really well, I never forget the day that I went to my wife's job and I said, babe, this is the last day you have to work here. You can now be a stay-at-home mom and do what it. you want to do. And, and so that was important for me. So I don't know if it's about, can, can I still be the man of my house if my wife out earns me? Okay. And I know you're going to say something really ratchet, I'm a, but I I'm, think yes. I think I'm yes, I'm actually you can. not going to say anything really ratchet because it's a real sensitive subject for me. Okay. So I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a be pastoral. I'm going to pretend like YouTube doesn't exist. This is one of those things, as for me and my house, if you're a man at Union Church, 
outside of sickness, deathbed, and hospitalization. Mm. We don't do stay-at-home dads. Mm. <laughs> Cricket. I don't need an amen. So, so I'm the no. Bible makes the man the provider and the protector. Does that make sense? Yeah. It is my job to make sure that my household needs nothing. So when God says that's what you're supposed to be, it's not just what you do, it's what you be. Mm. So even if I'm not making as much money as my wife is making, even if we don't need my money because she's making no money, she's making so much money, when I'm not working, I am going to be empty on the inside. Because I'm missing a part of the identity that God has given me. So good. We've made work all about income. Yeah. Instead of work about calling and fulfillment. Yeah. There is something that puts, I mean, some fire in your chest. When you wake up in the morning, put some clothes on, walk out that door, have a mission, accomplish that mission, and walk back in the door and said, I did something today. Regardless of how much I got paid, I moved life forward today. And hear me, y'all next me to be this pastoral. If you're not doing that, if you wake up with no mission, you don't got to be anywhere. There's nothing you got to move forward that day. There is going to be an emptiness on the inside of you. Let me say something wild that even God can't fill. Mm. Because God won't fulfill when you're outside of what he's made you to be. And he's made you to build something. He's made you to move something forward. He's made you to create something. And it's not just about income. It's about calling. Yeah. So we're going to go to work. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, can my wife make more money than me? Absolutely. Put it in our joint account, and I'm about to go buy me. 100%. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, here's a thought that came to my mind. Yeah. What if your wife comes from a wealthy family? Yeah. And she's worth millions yeah. before you. Are you going to say, no, no, no. Yeah, it's insane. We ain't going to live off of that. Because I, <laughs> dumb, bro. <laughs> you better spend her money like it's yours and live your and insane. But, you know, we're all men. That ego thing. Yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not, I don't want anybody to live small or have a small dream. At the same time, I want to touch uh, some of the issues that people may be at right now, right? Because sometimes when somebody may hear what you're saying and they think, well, I guess that's only if I'm a CEO of an organization or if I'm a pastor of a what you you know, mean? large church. Guys who are like, wake up every day and kill something. If you're an Uber driver, kill it, kill something. You work for Amazon. Kill like whatever level can we, you're can we, on. You kill something. Can we talk about an Uber driver? Uh, yes. Uber driver. Yo, so I ordered an Uber Black, right? Yep. This guy pulls up in his Tahoe, got a full suit on, tie, comes out, grabs my bag, throws it in the back seat. So I'm like, all right, let's talk. This dude started as an Uber driver mm. in a hoopty car. Paid his bills, saved every penny after he paid his bills, wow. got rid of the hoopty car, bought a Tahoe. He said, actually, I now own four different black cars. Wow. I have got my own limousine business outside of Uber. He said, I just do Uber during the day because it's dead season. But he said, at night, I'm driving CEOs and people all around, got my own business. It doesn't matter where you start. Come on. If you wake up and punch it in the face and kill it every single day, you won't stay where you start. You will you'll move up. Sheesh. You'll move up. Yes. Shout out to the Uber drivers. Shout out to Uber drivers. Let's we love go. y'all. Thank y'all. What we got next? All right, before the next question, let's go ahead and check out this clip. First though, what is roster dating? Like, am I, I'm not, I, I can't be the only one confused about that. Like, what, what are we talking Hear, about? Hearing the name threw me off a little bit as well. I think it's, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. So I think we, at one point in time, we have like a roster, like a, maybe like a starting lineup. Yeah. You know, you have, you have your, yeah. you have your, your go, you know, your, your point. Then you got the backup. Point guard. Okay. For okay. the, for the backup, you know, and then, you know, if, but that was before like low management, you know, but then so oh, okay. you might have to like have another wow. one that you call up, you know, and then have some in the reserve that you got to call. Six man. Six man. Rookie of the year. Six rookie man. of the year. Wow. Oh, He's the defensive, oh, defensive oh, player of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, so, All right. We yeah. good. I, so just, we try, see, I need the clarification. It's the new school. They call it something different. You know what I'm saying? So Rizzy. 
Yo, I get exhausted even thinking about going back to 10 years ago now that I'm married. And maybe that's it, it's cool like when you're young, but if you're 30, you're 40 now, like it's time to relax a little bit and just stay up focused on the one. Time. Absolutely, absolutely. Cap. absolutely. Cap. <laughs> Cap. All right, so this Cap. one is Cap. all for the single fellas <laughs> in go. the room. All right, pastor, so here's the question. Some truth in church, go ahead. How do you avoid being labeled while trying to find women in the church? All right. We, We're here. You gotta explain the cat part, though. Okay. I'm gonna let you weigh in. Yep. We on YouTube. Yes. Yes. <laughs> YouTube, what up? Can I? Can I just keep it 100? They act like roster dating is bad. The only thing bad about it is y'all put a title on it. But every man in this room, from 92 to 18, knows. When before you were married, you had a list of I'm going to go after her first. And if that don't work out, then I'm going to go to this one. I got my number three. Got my, you never told them. But every dude had not just one woman that he was looking at. But it's like, I'm going to shoot my shot. And if I miss, I'm going to the next. I'm going to the next. That's called life, bro. <laughs> but now all of a sudden, because we put a title, roster dating, oh, yeah. and now it sounds so heinous. Yeah. It's like, oh, you, nah, bro, that's life, man. Yeah, know, what what your mama said, you don't, yeah, can you count, roster count your date? chickens before they hatch? <laughs> is it wrong true. to roster date in the, in the church, though, like at your campus? This is where, <laughs> at your campus. Wow. <laughs> this, this, this is where I'm like, am I on YouTube? <laughs> ask, the, ask the question one more time. How do you avoid being labeled while trying to meet women in the church? All right. I'm y'all pastor, right? Who cares how they label you if in the end you get the prize? I could care less what the four that didn't get me labeled me as because I got the one I was looking for and ultimately, I'm he who findeth a wife, not he who avoideth a label. You, you can label... Now, there's always a balance to it. You should spend time observing a lady before you ask her out to see if she is what you are looking for. You can tell by the way she carries herself, the way she acts around other men. You could tell by her friends and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to go out on the first date. I would not go on a date with a woman I know nothing about. You're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. So do your observation and all that and know that there's some type of qualities that you're looking for. But if you date a girl at Union Church and you do it in a godly manner, you keep your integrity and it don't work and you break up. Come on to the next. And the next, and the next. Yeah, but here's the thing. <laughs> they, they're clapping and all that. But, but the man's like, from flower to flower to. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just be honest. Dudes don't know how to date. That's true. That's true. Yes. Yeah. And these church dudes uh -oh. don't know. Y'all gonna let him talk about y'all like that? How to date. First of all, first of all, a lot of these church dudes, they're using God to get the date. Uh, so not a union. I promise you. At your church, sir. That, that's Charlotte. <laughs> right. He said that's Charlotte. He said Charlotte. that. No, nope. Charlotte, Flowers, UBC. That, they are absolutely don't, don't bring UBC like, in this. They are, they're absolutely using God. Yeah, man, I just feel something. I just feel God is just when I see you, God. And the moment, and the moment, the moment Dad, you threw God into this, you're a coward. she's thinking, Oh, wife, I'm wife to you. Uh, you just, yeah, God, I've been, I've been praying, and God said, yeah. you should go out, right? You're, so you use God, because it's a coward move. You're a coward, that's a coward move, You use move, God bro. rather than going on your own, because it's almost like, I didn't really want to, but God made me. Oh, Lord. So it wasn't really my choice. I was pushed into this by my heavenly father. And then, so now you've already created an image in her mind. Wow, God told you to come to me. Is this, before is, this a date. Where is, is this where we're telling all dirt? Let's do it. Yeah, I told a girl God told me. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't Zion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what happens is, how did it go? Did it, huh? How did it go? Did it? That she was coming. <laughs> 
So that's what I'm saying. But that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, that was so a good. Was a good. Is now, now you created. Yeah, an I probably image. broke her heart. Not, of yeah, course, because you fault. created an image in her if mind. You watching? My bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just Dang, man. I was just laughing. Hey, I was laughing at hold them. Up, hold up, and I realized hold up, I was one of them. Hold up. Anyway. My bad, too. I did it. <laughs> if you're watching, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You weren't caring. I'm sorry. Church guys, <laughs> be like. <laughs> oh. I, did, I did it, too. I had a dream. <laughs> she was in a dream. Did you stand up in front of people? No, but I told her. Oh, I didn't tell her. I, I, I stood up in front of like, the whole church. Oh, deal. no. Yeah, no, it was bad. It was bad. It was, no. it was, it was a straight up crash and burn. No, I did tell the pastor like I, that God <laughs> told me, you know, and all that stuff. What I'm saying is that you created an image so now yeah, yeah. after you have the first two three dates and it doesn't go well you have to now you now you ghost her because you're, you're still a coward you're not you're not even man enough to say I, I miss her from God so now you just ghost her I miss, <laughs> so now you ghost her and she's so now yes she's telling everybody this is the dude that likes to play games a lot of dudes uh because of because a lot of women who are Christian, they are praying, fasting, asking God to send them a husband. And then here you show up and you smooth and you talk well. You can carry a sentence. Got all your teeth. You, you got all your teeth. You halfway go to church. You worship. <laughs> you serve on a team. Are you crazy? Like, yo, all you do is approach the women. You serve on a team and you work. Do you know she's looking at you like, oh my God, like what? And so uh, what's happening is dudes will use that. And so now they're just, they're, they're not going in with ease. It's like, it's like they married from day one. I, I will say though, that's a, that's a Christian thing though. Yeah. If guys are like, they're waiting for marriage, they're living godly, like they're trying to do it God's way. I find a lot of them, like they profess their love. This is the chick I'm going to marry. And it's only the second date. Yes. And it's like, you don't even know anything about her. Dude. Take, I can't sing that song. We're talking about dating, but <laughs> take it slow. <laughs> take it slow. Yeah. Go with the friendship route. Go with the coffee route. Go with the we're talking route. To me, as long as you're not over-promising and as long as you're not getting physical, like there's not physical, we're not kissing, we're not touching, we're not, we're not doing all that. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah. I should be able. I'm sorry, the song just kept in my head. Right. I it's should be physical, <laughs> physical. I'm sorry. No, don't I do that. Don't able, do that. I should be able to, yes, have yeah. a conversation with you, pursue you. And if it don't work out, I should be able to talk to anybody else. Yeah. Can I change the subject just yeah, for a man. second? Let, Let me look at y'all. Here's a thought that just came to my mind. And I was thinking about, you were talking about coward and using God, shooting your shot and all that. This goes for finding your wife, building a great marriage, building wealth, fulfilling your calling, making an impact. If you're more afraid of being humiliated than you are of being effective, you will never get anything done in life. Let me say that again. If you're more afraid of being humiliated than you are of being effective, you will never get anything done in life. Humiliation is part of shooting your shot, taking a risk, living by faith. And anybody who's built a great business, a great marriage, a great kid, they've fallen on their faith at times. And sometimes we're so caught up in how people view us. You know when you're winning, they're going to view you right. Don't worry about how they view you now. Just worry about winning and their rep your reputation will take care of it. We're, we're, we're managing our reputations too much mm. instead of just going after what God's called us to go after. Yeah. And your reputation will take care of it. You know, that was really good. Like, like you're good at this. Like, you're really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> what we got next? Uh, P.S. We got an anonymous question from Anonymous wow. question. Yes. Wow. Okay. Who is it? Okay. Show yourself. Um, <laughs> I test drove a car. He ain't talking about nobody's yeah. car. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's why it's not. What, what's her name? What's her name? I test drove. I test drove the car. We repented and never did it again. It wasn't good, but I feel like this is my soulmate. What wasn't good? What is that even? E everything about this. That's from Charlotte. Charlotte. That's from Charlotte. Charlotte ain't got nothing to do with that. That is not Charlotte at this all. This man said, test, read it again. And okay. I didn't hear a question. This sounds like a confessional. Is this a question? Or? He's in my confession. <laughs> Priest, will you forgive me? Watch this. Watch this. So I, I test drove the car. Uh -huh. We repented, never did it again. 
It wasn't good, but I feel like this That's is my why you soulmate. Never did it again. So I feel like they're asking, like, like what should I do? Asking what should he do? Is that the question? What he's saying? What he's he saying? Say, he feels like it's his soulmate. Woo! <laughs> should I stay? This should is I leave? Senior passing question. This is not a lead passing question. This is a senior passing question. <laughs> All right. So, a couple, a couple, couple of things I disagree with this question. Let's start from the back and then figure it out forward. Stop it. Stop it. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. How you gonna be walking in there? Probably why it wasn't good. Anyway, oh my hey, no diddy, Jesus, no diddy. No diddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I guess that's why it's men's night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't believe in soulmates. Shoot, you started there. That's cap. This soulmate foolishness. Jesus. Here, here, here's the idea of a soulmate. That out of 8.4 8. 4 billion people, let's say half of them are women, 4.2 billion people on the planet, there's only one person that I'm compatible with? God almighty, I'll be 90 before I find them. Wow. <laughs> Sheesh. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea that I've got a soulmate, this is the only person on planet Earth that God has created for me, it's not biblical. There is nowhere in the Bible where God told a man, you have to go marry that woman. <laughs> Even when he, the guy, he said, you got to go marry a prostitute. Yeah, yeah. He said, you get to pick any prostitute you yeah, yeah, yeah. want. He, <laughs> Even he had a choice. Yeah, yeah. This is getting crazy about a second. So if God never told a man, you have to marry that woman, that means there's no biblical context for this soulmate idea that only one woman can be compatible to me. Yeah. I'm looking for values. I'm looking for you know, shared vision. I'm looking, there's different things that I'm looking for, but the idea that one person on the planet possesses all those things, that's, that's cap. That's just not true. So this whole thing of this is my soulmate. No, y'all had sex, and now you have a soul tie. Mm. Mm. And now you're getting ready to connect yourself to someone that is going to hold back the call of God in your life instead of propel you towards the call of God in your life. So mm. that's, that's one, two. It's never good the first time, man. It'll get better. Just figure it out. Oh, my. I agree with that 100%. Say again? I agree 100%, 100%. You said what? I agree 100%. Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. That's it. That's all right. I'm going to help us out. We're going to turn our attention to the screen for this next clip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, when it comes to like controlling your emotions, I think I've learned it on the back end of my life rather than the, the, the beginning. Because to be honest, uh, my parents really didn't even know how to do life together. And so I saw them, y'all. I saw them arguing, yelling at each other, the, the whole nine, literally first grade, learning to cuss because I've heard the words in the home. Yeah. That was my kind of life. But thank God they're saved now. They love each other. It's really great. Happy marriage. But the thing that I, I'm noticing now is just like if I can't find an outlet for my emotions, it's going to come out somewhere. Wow. And typically it comes out in the worst times, in the worst moments. Okay. And now having kids and then having my wife, like it. It, you, you're exposed because they see you so intimately and see you in those moments. You're exposed all the time. You feel like you can't go anywhere. And this is why it's helpful to go somewhere, get a hobby, do something else, like do something that's going to calm you down, something that's going to take the whatever you got to do. I don't care what it is, but we got to find something. You know, so, man, really good. I love what you said. You're talking about, man, our emotions come out at the worst times. I think for all of us as men, we want to act or sometimes pretend that we don't feel anything or we don't have these emotions and then we're caught off guard when it does come out at the worst time and I have a blow up and so the reality is it's like 
you you got to go talk to somebody. You yeah. got to get into therapy. You got to yeah. do the work. And even when you go to therapy, you got to actually be honest, yeah. be transparent. Because sometimes I'll be real. It was like Stephanie, like, hey, you need to go talk to somebody. It's like, all right, babe, I'll go talk to somebody. Yeah. Awesome. And then you just go talk, but you never open up. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. if you're willing to take that step, at least be willing to take it in full stride. That's yeah. good. That's good. Mm. The question around this topic is, what's the best way for men to fully express our emotions? Oh, say it again so I have time to think. Go ahead, read it again. Yeah. <laughs> what's the best way for us men to fully express our emotions? What's the best way for us men to fully express our emotions? I think two thoughts come to mind. The first thought that comes to my mind is anger. Mm -hmm. And I think anger has been so mischaracterized characterized in church that we now think anger equals sin. Mm. So we think that if I get angry or if I am angry, it means I'm ungodly. When the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin, which means the Bible separates anger and sin and says, hey, when you get angry, don't say stuff you can't take back. Don't try to tear people down. Don't get violent. In other words, make sure you have anger. It even talks about being able to control your anger. So I think, first of all, we've got to have a healthy definition of emotion yeah. and realize the devil didn't create emotion. God did. And if God did, it's not a bad thing. So if I'm angry, that's not bad. There are some things in this world you should get angry about. And if you don't get angry about it, I'm wondering, A, is the spirit of God in you? Yeah. And B, are you really a man? Because a real man would have got angry if that had happened in his atmosphere or whatever. Maybe sadness is not a bad thing. Joy is not a bad thing. All that other good stuff. So I think, first of all, just have a healthy understanding that there's not an issue with any of the emotions. The issue is, does that emotion take me to a place of sin? If that emotion takes me to a place of sin, it's not about the emotion. It's about a wound that's on the inside. Mm. If I get angry and in my anger, I'm cussing my girlfriend out. I'm, I'm smacking my kids in the face. I'm punching holes in the wall and all that other good stuff. Hear me, whatever the girlfriend, whatever the wife, whatever the kids did, that's not what the issue is. The issue is there's something in your heart from years ago that's never been healed, never been dealt with. And that girlfriend, that spouse, that kid or whatever pushed that unhealthy part and it triggered that situation, got years of unaddressed yeah. issues. Yeah. Last thing is express your emotion in safe places. Yeah. Ooh, Brian, I'm getting in trouble. Let's do it. And some of us are not quite married to safe places. Wow. Some of us are not quite married to safe places. So there are some women that will use your emotion and throw it back in your face and will push you, push you, push you, push you to the point where they, they're trying to get a reaction out of you and they're trying to get you to go off or trying to do or whatever it may be. And you've got to see two things. One, this is not a healthy relationship. If we're married, we need to go to marriage counseling now because she will push me to a place where I lose control. Yeah. And hear me, it does not matter what she does. You guys know how it works. You will always take responsibility. It doesn't matter who pushed you. You're the man. You're the one that's responsible for the situation. And then two, if it ain't wifey, get out. Yeah. Don't, don't be in an environment where you've got, whether it's a girlfriend, whether it's friends or whatever, people who use your negative emotions to manipulate and yeah. take it. They don't love you. They're not for you. They don't have their back and they're not going to move you towards the destiny yeah. that God has for you. Yeah. I think the Bible talks about times and seasons, yeah, yeah. And understanding times and seasons. And I think men have to understand what, what, who am I in this room? In some rooms, I am pastor, leader, I am leading the team. I'm running the staff. In some other rooms, I am father. 
And even with my own kids, I have to know when I'm father, the, the disciplinarian, and when I'm father, the goofy, let's turn on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and pretend we're all fighting. Let's just have a party. Um, I got to know what room I'm husband. I got to know what room that I'm just friend in this room. One of the things I love about, it's funny because I've asked you this question. We, I've asked you, hey man, if I get angry or I'm, I'm one of vent, who do I, who do I talk to? He was like me. Um, so, <laughs> so I think that even when I come to, to Union in, here in DMV, like if I'm in Charlotte, I am, I'm leading. I'm in a room, I'm watching all- everything. When I come here, I'm weeping like a little baby because I don't have to be that person here in this room. I get to just be a son. I get to just be submitted. I just get to be. And I think men have to diversify their rooms. They don't have that place. Yeah. To figure out the more, the, the more, the, the less rooms you are in, the less opportunities you have to express certain emotions. And I realized that I have such a diverse group of rooms that I get to, I get a room where I get to be friend. I get a room where I get to be leader and I get a room where I get to be all those, express all those different emotions. If, if your relationship is unhealthy, work is stressful, kids are all over the place, and you've got no place to release all of that, you're going to lose your mind. Or you're going to do something real stupid. Yeah. And a lot of men, we've got all this stress on us, and we've never thought, man, if I don't take care of myself, if I don't have a healthy outlet, yeah. The, listen, the enemy will always give you an unhealthy outlet. And you that's why we got connect groups. And, and the deal is you may not want to go to a union church connect group with 15 different men and sit down with anything on your heart. I hate my wife. That may not, <laughs> that may not be <laughs> that escalated quickly, right? Hey, but it happens. <laughs> listen, it happens. my wife's watching. I ain't going to say it. <laughs> But in that group, you may meet one guy that you connect with. And I've got those guys in my life that I can just call and just vent. And they're not going to preach to me. They're not going to pray for me. They're not going to tell me I'm being ungodly. You know what they're going to say? Man, I feel you. I've been there or whatever. And I'm able to get all of the stress off of my life. And so I don't even need nobody to say nothing. Let me just say it out loud. And it's just like... I feel, but men don't have that because so often, once again, we're trying to protect our reputation. So we don't want any other man to know that we don't have it all together. Mm. So we're never honest and transparent around anybody. When you've got stress on your life and no honest circles in your life, you will either explode or implode. That's good. And uh, you'll never get to the finish line. That's so good. So what about the man in the room that says, no, I can muscle my way through it. I don't need a therapist. I don't need connect groups. Like, I can do this by myself. I've been doing it for this long, and we've been, I've learned my whole life how to do this. I've been muscling through. I've been fine this yeah. far. Yeah. Do I need a therapist? Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of pastors that are like that. And somewhere between 40 and 55, triple bypass surgery. Heart attack, ulcer. Got me on it. Year, what are we, year 13 of Union Church? Probably about year 8 to 10. I started having uh, pre-ulcers, all these different type of health-related stuff. And I go into the doctor, and the doctor says, first question he asks me, what do you do for a living? And I told him what I did for a living. He said, all of this is stress. Mm. And he said, for some reason, you're taking in stress, and you don't have healthy outlets. And he starts going, how much are you exercising? How much are you sleeping? How much are you working out and all that? And he literally told me, he said, the stress that you're under, if you don't find some healthy outlets, this is going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Mm. So any guy that says, I can take on the stress of the world, I don't need any place to just exhale and breathe and I'm good, you will explode or implode. And we think it's always sin. So we're like, as long as I don't cheat on my wife or I don't end up on drugs or alcoholic, I handled it. And sometimes it's the later parts of our lives where our health is completely crumbling, where your body is telling you, you didn't take care of me. So now I'm not going to take care of you. So you, you, we weren't made, we ain't God. We were not made to carry the world on our shoulders. And when you see, you can see someone like, if you ever talk to somebody in prison or you ever talk to somebody who's totally ruined their life, you might say, 
They don't say, man, I just snapped. But it wasn't they snapped in the moment. It was 10 years of stress on their life that all of a sudden came out one bad conversation. This probably came to mind. You yep. take a, a soda can, yep. shake it once, yep. it won't explode. Mm. It takes a couple times. Yep. And it, and it, that first stressful moment, you can handle that. But it's, it's year after year after year after year after year 100%. without any type of outlet. So, yep. so, you're, so you're sitting in the Popeye's store and, and they mess up your order and <laughs> you go off. Oh, so the chick- <laughs> and you're thinking it was just this worker. And now you're getting arrested and you're going to jail. <laughs> that escalated <laughs> quickly. Because of years of not dealing with, of trying to muscle it through. Popeyes can push you to that, though. They do, they do, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. If you work at Popeyes, I love you. You ever been to Popeyes, they ain't got no chicken? They ain't got no chicken, <laughs> they ain't got no biscuits. Pull over to the side. No chicken, hours. no biscuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How you a chicken spot with no chicken? Yeah, yeah. That's why yeah, yeah. we go to hip hop. Yeah. All right, what do we got? First off, Popeyes is good, but we're going to turn our attention <laughs> to the screen one more time. Experience has been my only teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, how we grew up, how we were taught, um, everything that we learned, everything that we went through, experience was the teacher. It was the lesson. It was the wisdom and the knowledge. Uh, so the idea of submission uh, it's generally been a hard concept for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. I think too, like, man, I love this conversation because there's so many like buzzwords with like submitting to my pastor and then what, what's a mentor. Yeah. And I think there's a major difference between somebody like a mentor that's like a big brother figure, you got my back, you're helping me out versus I'm submitted to somebody and I'm letting you speak into my real life situations and I'm letting you speak into and have a say in my real life decisions that's too. Good. Right. I think sometimes we can miss the benefits of like submitting to to an individual, to to an authority. I remember a season where I was submitted to um, an authority and it gave him that space to speak into my life. But just even being in proximity of that individual, I'm able to see how they navigate through their marriage, how they mm-hmm. navigate through their finances, through yeah. tough business decisions. And I'm able even without sitting me down and say, hey, this is what I did here. This is what I did. Just being able to be in the view and the scope of that. I'm able to take those things and even model that and then seeing that and how that translates even to how I lead and, and my, my home and my family and my wife being yeah. submitted to me as well. So um, so I think there's a bunch of benefits from being submitted to an authority there for sure. So. <clears throat> We find it that for most men, submission is hard. Mm -hmm. And generally, especially in ministry or outside of ministry, women submit easy. Why is it hard for men to submit? And what does it look like? Oh, Ray, have some fun. Yeah. All right. Let's let's talk about let's talk about men submitting and church. So we've been running three, four, five years at this point. And uh, if you're if you're churched, um, you know they call the senior pastor the spiritual father, a like spiritual father of the house. And there's this like if you're not churched, it's gonna sound really weird. Don't worry about it. It's what we do. But uh, <laughs> but there's this idea, and you'll hear people say, "I'm a son of the house. I'm a son of the house. I'm a son of the house." When we first started running, I remember having conversations with you about, hey, let's not make a big deal about the spiritual father, spiritual father, spiritual son right now. And the reason why I said that is two reasons. One, I understand that most men have not seen a healthy natural father. Mm. And the Bible says that a healthy natural father teaches you how to relate with God. So if I don't have a natural father that is healthy, then I'm not even going to trust God. So I've never as a pastor tried to like force men, I'm your spiritual father, you need to be a spiritual, because I know that if they haven't had that health, they haven't even figured out how to relate with God. And if they can't relate with God well, I can't expect them to relate with me well. So So we'll, we'll build towards that. And I remember one time we sat down, and this was right before you went to Charlotte. And I said, Brian, you sit down with your wife and write down everything that you dream about your life. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Not just what you dream about your church and your ministry, but everything you dream about your life. And you wrote it down. And I remember, maybe not word for word, but somewhere around this idea of, hey, if you come on and do Union Charlotte, if you walk with me, if you let me be your spiritual father, I will make it my mission to help you fulfill everything you wrote down. And that's what 
fathership is or fatherhood is, and that's what submission is. It's when I have somebody over me that's committed to helping me yeah. fulfill all the dreams that God has called me to fulfill. The job of a father is to help their children go and maximize all their potential. We've ran into such unhealthy authority yeah. that it's not authority, it's manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me hustle you, make you cry, and until you give an offering to my church, or mm -hmm. let me tell you what you do here, or let me tell no, you lay down your dreams, lay down your vision. I talked to a guy one time that said, I asked, what's the vision for your life? And he said, I don't have one. I'm serving my pastor's vision. Mm. And I was taught that it's dishonoring to have a vision when I'm under authority of a visionary. So good. And it's like, what kind of sick, manipulative <laughs> foolishness is that? Yeah. So I think first, it is what is real fatherhood? What is real authority? Yeah. My job as a spiritual father of this house is to help every single person I encounter yeah. fulfill the vision that God has for them. Yeah. It's not my job to manipulate them to help me fulfill my vision. Yeah. And I think if we get a biblical understanding of what that is, Submission is easy. And here's the thought that came to my mind. If I were to say, hey, Warren Buffett, the billionaire, or Zuckerberg, or Elon Musk wants to take you under their wings and teach you how to be rich, ain't one person in their right mind going to say no. Yeah. It's like they want to help me get to where they are? Absolutely. So the only reason a man struggles to submit is that he doesn't understand or see this person is here to help me yeah. get to the vision that I have yeah. for my life. Yeah. Pastoring, understanding my, first of all, I think every man, there are certain things every man needs, right? Every man needs a coach. Every man needs a mentor. Every man needs, in my opinion, a wife. Every man needs. No, no, not your opinion. Every man needs a every wife. Every man needs a wife. Uh, every man needs a doctor, right? Every man needs a therapist. Every man needs a pastor. Every man needs a father. Every man needs a father. And one of the things that helped me with pastoring, I was, I was on a, uh, I was watching this track and field, and uh, I was watching uh, this guy. He was on the. There was these, these uh, kids who were running. They were like they were like teenagers, and he was training them. And he had a whistle, and he would tell them run, run, and they run. He said, "Come back." When you pulled off, your head was down. You pick your pick your head up. Run again. Go back. You know you didn't come off the block strong enough. Now I'm looking at the guy. This guy looked like the most out of shape guy. I've ever seen in my life. Like <laughs> he looked like he couldn't run past tomorrow, right? <laughs> and so I'm looking at these in shape, like track stars running, doing what he says. And I realize that the reason why they're listening to him is because he can see what they can't see. He has a perspective they don't have. And they may have the talent, but they're lacking the wisdom. Yeah. And they need someone wise to help them run further, faster than they ever could. And I realized that one of the things that you have done for me is you're on the sideline and you blow the whistle every time. It's like, hey, you, you need to have a Sabbath. <laughs> hey, you know, preach shorter sermons. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> what I'm saying is that what I realized is that pastoring is allowing somebody the ability to, you give them, per, I'm giving you permission yeah. to look at my life and see the blind spots and point them out. And because I'm giving you that permission and because I trust that God placed you in my life, I'm going to listen and I'm going to respond, not because I'm some child and you're this big guy that can't know, but it's because uh, 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 wisdom is something that every person needs. It's the principal thing. Yeah. And my life has become more blessed as a result of giving you the whistle and letting you teach me how to run. And uh, I think for me, uh, I'm running faster, I'm running farther, and I'm having a fun time doing it Come on, because I let somebody pass me. Yeah. Phil Jackson. Yep. Bill Belichick. Yep. Nick Saban. Yep. LeBron James, he was his own coach. We all know that. <laughs> but when you think about all the greats, you know their coach. Yeah. Because there's not someone who is great at what they do 
that doesn't allow them to be coached. And I find, I mean, lean forward. I'm not trying to be mean, fellas. A lot of men have no coach. Yeah. They're out here trying to figure it out on their own. Nobody coaching me to build wealth. Nobody coaching me to be godly. Nobody coaching me to build a great marriage. Nobody, and, and not even looking for coaches. Yeah. And if you're not looking for a coach, you don't really want to be great. Because mm. there is no such thing as greatness yeah. without a coach. We were talking, me and Pops were talking about on the golf course today. And he, Pops is going off. We, anyway, I'm going to stay out of trouble with that one. But he was saying, man, I tried to put my hand around a younger guy. And I coached him up. And he completely ignored everything I told him. Yeah. And then ran out to his friends and did what his friends told him to do. Yeah. And then circled back months later and was like, man, I should have listened to you. Yeah. And a lot of times we want to listen to a podcast. We want to look at somebody who's our same age, yeah. who's not further ahead, hasn't even accomplished anything yet. Instead of listening to some, I'm not saying they always have to be older than you, but they got to be further ahead than you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be broke. Listen to somebody who's broke yeah. on how to build wealth. Yeah. Don't be out of shape listening to somebody who's out of shape and ain't never been in shape yeah. on how to get in shape. It's got to be somebody that is a... That's what the Bible says. Yeah. It says older men treat the younger men like sons. Yeah. Younger men look at the older men as fathers. And here's what a real father is. A father is a man who wants his kids to go further than he ever did. Yeah. When you find that guy who wants to help you go further than they've ever been, yeah. that's the type of person you need to yeah. attach yourself. Well, let's end with let's end with this. Um, I get to be the guy that gets to embarrass you, uh -oh. and I get to say on behalf of every campus pastor, me as a lead pastor, your leadership of our lives has made all of us better. And um, you may not always feel like you get the accolades and everybody may not always scream your name, but we talk about legacy. You look out in this room and you look online and from North Carolina to Virginia. You're trying to make me show emotion. I'm like, just telling you right now, <laughs> you on. are leaving a legacy. Yes, you are a father of fathers yes, and uh, you are a leader of leaders. <laughs> and we appreciate you, man. Come on, y'all. Let's honor our senior pastor. Pastor Stephen R. Taylor. Give me a hand for this people.